Good to see everybody. We're glad that you're with us today. I want you to do something I rarely ask you to do. I want you to pull out your phone. Pull out your phone. Go ahead. You can have it on right now. My phone is on right now. There's my wife. I don't know if you can see that or not. She caught a huge fish bigger than me that day. It was a sad day, but she's a beautiful woman, so she's on my screensaver. You know what's on my wife's screensaver? My grandkids. That's what's on my wife's screensaver. I will never be on my wife's screensaver ever again, thanks to my grandchildren. You got your phone out? Go ahead and scroll up on it. Open it up just a little bit if you would, and then open up that Sagebrush app. For those of you who don't have the Sagebrush app, go to your app store and get the Sagebrush app because there's a ton of information that you can be aware of and that you can sign up for. I don't know if you know this, but we got group match coming up. So if you go to the top banner, you scroll over one time, there's group match that says there, if you click on that little thing, it'll give you the registration, you'll be set to go. You wanna get in a small group this next semester as your kids go back to school? You wanna grow in your relationship with Jesus? You need to come to group match. Scroll back one over, there's the core classes. What's core classes? How to share your faith. How to study the Bible, basic Christian beliefs. These are all classes that I've written. I put them on the video. They are a great time. Hundreds of people have gone through those. Then scroll two more times over and you're gonna see salt. This is our Sagebrush Academy of Leadership Training. Now, this is not for the faint of heart, friends. There's homework involved in this particular class. We would say it's the closest thing you can get to to go into a seminary class. But if you want to dive deep into the Word of God, you need to be a part of SALT. So all you do is click on these little icons that are there at the very front, and you sign up on the registration, and you get yourself ready to go. Listen, we're just trying to give you space. We, we're trying to give you space so you can grow in your relationship with Jesus. And so reading the Bible, we got this class coming up, Bible in 90 Days. You can sign up for that. We've got marriage classes, living free classes, recovery classes, all kinds of things. And they're all listed right there on the app. So during the boring parts of my message today, just take the time to just kind of scroll through the app and see the different things that are there. Now, if you're going to do that, just do me one favor. Put that phone on silent right now. I'm tired of your Jazzy J ringtone thing, all right? So if you could work on that, we would appreciate that. A couple of weeks ago, we're very proud of this. Our student ministry had their annual rally, and there were a ton of teenagers that came, and we want to show you a little bit about that. Take a look at this. Such a great time. We're so proud of our student team. Thank you to all the volunteers that showed up and helped us pull that off. Over 100 volunteers showed up for that event as well. It was epic. 65 kids gave their lives over to Jesus Christ. We got like 50 kids signed up to get baptized. It's going to be incredible. What a great, great time. Thank you for your generosity. It's because of your generosity where things like that can actually happen. All right. With all that said, let's get into the message today. Last week, if you remember, we talked about our thoughts, and we talked about the fact that our thoughts are a steady stream of consciousness, that our thoughts never seem to slow down, and we shared the fact that our thoughts lead us to a destination, don't they? And that destination can be a good thing, or it could be a bad thing. But our thoughts are leading us to one place or the other. So we said we're going to take every thought, and we're going to make it captive. We're going to make it obedient to Jesus. That this last week, we were going to spend time, when thoughts came into our head, asking ourselves the question, is this thought right now honoring of God? And if it's not a thought that we thought was honoring of God, not a thought that we thought Jesus would have, then we would take that thought and we would replace that thought with the right thought. 
And the way we're going to replace that thought was by reading Scripture. We're going to immerse ourselves in Scripture. And I challenge you to read at least one chapter of the Bible uh, each day. And that takes a whopping three minutes a day to pull off. And then we said that we were going to memorize Scripture. Do you remember that? We are going to memorize Scripture so that we would have the mind of God. We would understand the Word of God. We could hear the voice of God through the Word of God. Uh, there was a young man by the name of Danny, and he went splunking. Now, for those of you who don't know what splunking is, it's when you go and you explore a cave. So Danny goes in there with the guide to explore this cave, and he, the guide says, listen, I'm going to take you down a narrow passageway, and uh, it's going to get extremely narrow, but once we get through, you're going to see some amazing stuff that most people have never laid their eyes on. Well, Danny was up for it. So it didn't bother Danny at all that he kind of had to bend down through the crevice to get, you know, farther down. Didn't even bother him when he had to get on his hands and knees to get through this tiny crevice that was there. Kind of bothered him a little bit when he had to get on his back and he had to kind of push with his heels to keep going down the narrow passageway. It really bothered him, though, when that passageway grew so narrow that he could feel the rock on his chest and the rock on his back. Do you have an, anybody claustrophobic? Do you know what I'm talking about right now? So when, when he uh, inhaled, he could move, but when he exhaled, he couldn't. And he couldn't raise his legs up, so he had to just kind of barely move on the heel of his shoe to go inch by inch by inch. It's pitch dark. He feels the rock above him, the rock under him. Guess what? His mind starts going to bad places. Where do you think his mind went to? It went to his death. He said, this is going to be my dying day. His mind began to spiral. It began to race out of control. Now, now, now this guy is a mountain climbing, skydiving, uh, uh, adventure seeking kind of a guy. But he said, you know what? I freaked out in that moment. And I told my guy, he said, I'm freaking out right now, man. And the guide said, I get it. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to listen to my voice. Block everything else out. Whatever your brain is telling you right now, block all of it out, and just focus on my voice. Danny, I have been this way before. And I will get you to the other side. Well, Danny calmed down. He listened to the voice of the guide. And the guide got him to the other side. How many times in your life have you found yourself on a rock in a hard place? And how many times has your mind begun to spiral out of control and, and you just don't even know what to think, you don't even know what to do, and, and it's getting darker and darker all around you and you are absolutely freaking out. Close your eyes. And listen to the still, small voice of God's Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. And hear him say this, I have been this way before. And I know how to get you to the other side. Friends, your mind is going to take you one place or another. It's either going to lead you to devastation, where you are conning yourself into sinning, or desperation, where you're telling yourself you're a no good so-and-so and you're a loser. Or you can take those thoughts captive. You can listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit of God that lives in you. And you can realize that you are more than a conqueror because of Christ Jesus, your Lord. Now, that's what we talked about last week. Now, Paul is going to shift here in the book of Ephesians. And we're going to be talking about the words that we say out of our mouths. Now, the Bible's interesting here. Proverbs 18, 21, the Bible says the tongue has the power of life and death. Death. That's true, isn't it? But by, by a raise of the hands, how many would say that you have used your words at some point in time to encourage somebody else? Come on, play along with the pastor. At home, play along. Campuses, play along. Put your hands up real high. Okay, some of you don't have your hands up. Find those people. You don't want to hang out with them because they've never said an encouraging word and you're not going to be the first one to hear it, okay? Okay, that was good. A lot of you participate. Appreciate that. How many of you would say that you've also used your words to do damage to somebody else? Raise your hand. You weren't as fast with that one, were you? Like, eh. How many of you were sitting next to a person who did damage to you? Just, I'm, I'm just kidding. Don't, no, 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 no. No, no, not both hands. That's not good. You're going to be sleeping in another room tonight. You realize that, don't you? 
Yeah, our words have the power of life and death, don't they? Remember that little children's thing where you say, sticks and stones break your bones, but names will never hurt me? That's a, that's a lie, isn't it? There was a guy named Matthew Lieberman. He did a study on the brain to see how our brain reacts to hurtful words. I found this very interesting. He wanted to see that if there was a difference in the way our brain responds to hurtful words and the way our brain responds to being hurt physically. So here's what they did. They would put brains side by side by side, these x-rays of these brains with these chemicals floating through them to show when they're firing and things like that. And and, and he wouldn't know which one had the broken leg compared to someone who just had a broken heart. And he wanted to see if there would be a difference between the emotional wound and the physical wound. And he found this to be interesting. There was no difference at all. So to your brain, you ready for this, the, the pain of a broken leg is the same as the pain of a broken heart. Now, now some of you would, would disagree with me on that. You'd say, no, no, Todd, the pain of a broken heart is far worse than the pain of a broken leg. Because they can reset your leg. They can do pins in your leg. Over time, your leg will heal up. Over time, it won't have lingering pain that was as bad when it first was broken. But when someone says something mean to you, When someone wounds you with their words, when it comes from a parent, it comes from a child, it comes from somebody you look up to, someone you admire, well, some of you, you're carrying those words around with you every moment of every day. You're still trying to prove your worth. You're still trying to prove your value. You're still trying to earn love from people who didn't want to give it to you. You're still trying to prove yourself from a mom or a dad that never said, I'm proud of you. And even though they've already passed over to the other side, you're still living your life for their approval, and you're never going to get it. Our words have the power of life and of death. I know that very well. Years ago, my wife and I, we went on a cruise with some friends of ours, and it was the last day of the cruise, and the ship was coming into port, and we were sitting there, we were talking, and and the room kind of smelled like sewage, just a faint hint of sewage. So our friend came in to talk to us for a second, and uh, my wife said, she said, do you smell a faint scent of sewage? He said, well, yeah, that's to be expected, because after a cruise is over, you get on the port, that's the first thing they do is they empty that stuff out. And without thinking, I turned to my wife and I said, oh, I thought it was your breath. (laughs) See, I wasn't thinking, much like you when you raised both hands. You understand what I'm saying? (laughs) I wasn't thinking at that point. I thought it was funny. And my friend laughed. He thought it was funny too. She did not laugh at all when I said that, okay? So I knew what we're talking about today just as bad as you do. So let's look at this passage of scripture. Ephesians chapter 4, we're starting with verse 25. He says this, put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. So first thing, if you're taking notes, is write this down. Stop lying and start sharing the truth in love. That's a pretty straightforward verse, wouldn't you say? Stop lying and start sharing the truth in love. There was a little boy, he had done something wrong, and his dad thought he caught him. But all he had was circumstantial evidence. Don't you hate that, parents, when you don't have an ironclad case? All you got is circumstantial evidence. Everything points to the kid, but you're not certain that he did it. And so the dad's putting the, the heat on the kid. You know, he's got the, the spotlight on his face, and he's drilling him with one question after another, trying to break the little guy's spirit. And he just won't break for anything. Because he knows his dad only knows so much. And he's thinking, maybe, just maybe, I can get out of this. And so he does something. He's an eight-year-old little boy, and he looks at his dad with tears in his eyes. And he said, Dad, don't you love me? Do you, do you think that I would lie to you? Now, now, parents, you've been there before, right? What would you say in response? Because this is what the dad said. Of course I do. Of course, I, I lie. Your mom lies. That's for sure, right? Everybody I know lies. Of course I think you're lying to me. Do you remember that story you heard when you were a kid about George Washington cutting down the cherry tree? You remember that one? George Washington is brought in by his dad, and the dad says, did you cut down the cherry tree? George Washington says, I cannot tell a lie. I cut down the cherry tree. That was written by a man named Parson Wims in the 19th century. He made the story up. So the best story we've got about not lying is a lie. Do you understand how messed up we are right now? Most of us believe that lying is absolutely necessary. 
that lying gets you out of tough fixes, that lying gets you out of difficult situations. For example, your wife comes up to you, and she says, how do I look in this outfit? And so you, you, you might have an opinion. You might have a thought that maybe, you know, this is not as flattering as some of the other outfits, but you, you happy wife, happy life, right? So you're not going to say that to her. You're not going to say you look like a giant potato. You're not going to say something like that, right? And so <laughs> what are you going to do? You're going you're, you're to say, oh, that's the best looking outfit I've ever seen in my life. Now, can I talk to the ladies here for just a second? What are you thinking when you ask him anyway? Do you, do you, have you not seen what he's got on right now? Do you understand what I'm saying? He is not fashion conscious. Do you understand? So don't go to him. Take a picture, FaceTime a girlfriend. I don't know. Call your daughter on the phone. Get somebody else's opinion. But I'm trying to help my brothers out right here. We don't want to be in that situation. Because we will lie. We will never, ever tell you the truth. Because we're trying to save our own necks. That's what's going on there. How many times has somebody wanted to do something with you? And you, you came up with an excuse as to why you couldn't do it. So, oh, I'd love to go out with you guys. Oh, I'd love to come over to your house for the barbecue. Oh, we have other plans. But you don't have any other plans. You'd rather be at home pulling nose hair out of each nostril one by one by one than to go spend any time with that dysfunctional family. But you can't say that, right? So what do we do? We, we call it a little white lie. A little lie is what we say. A little lie is like being a little pregnant. <laughs> It'll show up eventually. Did you know that when you lie, you align yourself with Satan? See, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But Satan, Jesus said, is the father of all lies. And when he lies, he speaks his native language, his native tongue. And here we are in church, here we are watching from home, we want to be more like Christ, and yet when we lie, even justifying our little lies is saying, well, nobody got hurt, and it got me out of a tough situation. You've just aligned yourself just right there with Satan himself. There's so many perks and so many benefits to not lying. Let me give you a few. You can lay your head on your pillow at night and not worry about covering up the lies the next day because you don't have anything to cover up for. You, you can lay your head on your pillow at night and, and have a nice sound sleep because your conscience is intact. Your integrity, your character is intact. My goodness, if you'll speak the truth in love, people will admire you. They'll respect you. They'll come for an honest answer. But if you're ever caught in a lie, no one's ever going to believe the words coming out of your mouth ever again. So Paul says, first things first, hey, when it comes to your mouth, don't lie and share the truth in love. And then he continues. He says, also, in your anger, don't sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, and don't give the devil a foothold. Now, what's he saying here? Well, write this down. Stop letting it rip when you're mad. The number one way we blow it with our mouth is when we're ticked off and when we're mad. And don't give me this garbage that you had righteous anger. Most of us have never had righteous anger one time in our entire life. What we have most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, if you're anything like me, is selfish anger. Someone didn't do what you wanted them to do. Someone didn't think what you wanted them to think. Someone didn't respond the way you wanted them to respond. And you got mad, you got upset. Hey, the traffic wasn't to your liking. You walked in the house, it was a mess. The kids didn't clean up their room. And so what did you do? You let it rip. How is it that we are the meanest to the people that we say we love the most on the face of this earth. My goodness, most of us would never act the way we act towards our spouse or towards our children, towards somebody else in our lifetime. What in the world gives you the right to talk to them that way? We have no right to wound someone else. We have no right to put them in their place and give them a piece of our mind. Some of us, <laughs> you've been given a piece of your mind for so long, I'm surprised you got a mind left to give. And maybe that's why you keep doing it, because you've got such a tiny little mind left, and you think this is acceptable behavior, because you think you've got righteous anger. Jesus got mad. 
He had righteous anger. And in his anger, he did not sin. You're feeling the blood boil into your face once again. You're getting ready to let it rip. Something's ticked you off. Something's got you upset. Someone didn't do what you thought they should do. And so you're ready to put them in their place. Well, rather than doing that, rather than hurting the other person with your words and saying things that you can never, ever take back again, just walk away from the situation for just a second. Just go into the room like we saw in the video and shut the door and just pray. Take the issue to God before you take the issue to someone else. This is going to take self-control. It's going to take restraint, but you can do it. you got the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You shut the door, you go in the other room, and you pray. And you tell God, that ticked me off, that made me mad. Now, how do you want me to respond, God? What would you have me do? What would you have me say? You are never going to hear God say, go slam them. Go shove it in their face. Go tell them what a loser they are and how stupid they are. You'll never hear God say that. How do I know that? Because he's never said it to you. He's never called you dumb. He's never called you stupid. He's never called you a loser. He's never called you a hypocrite. He's spoken the truth to you. He's shared with you things that need to change, things that need adjustments, and you have an opportunity to make those adjustments, but he's never slammed you for it. He's never hammered you for it. And the last time I checked, we're supposed to be like Jesus. We're supposed to respond just like Jesus would respond in that situation. So what do we do? We sit down and we pray. And we ask ourselves a couple of questions. Is this something worth getting mad about? Because let me tell you something. Two weeks from now, whatever you got mad about today, you won't remember it. For the most part, you won't remember. It wasn't worthy of anger. And anger is such a volatile emotion that can do such damage. Is this even worth it? And a lot of times God's Holy Spirit will say, what's your problem? Get over yourself. Do you realize what I've forgiven you for? Do you realize the patience that I've shown you? Show a little patience to somebody else. You pray. You ask God to give you his perspective. And then you formulate what you're going to say. And you walk back into that situation. And you say words that bring life rather than words that bring death. That's what he says. Don't let the sun go down while you're angry. Don't act like this. Don't, don't let it rip. And then the third thing is this. Stop using your words to discourage others and use your words to encourage others. I love Ephesians 4.29. Don't let any. It doesn't say some or few. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what's helpful for building others up according to their needs, and it may benefit those who listen. There was a group of frogs, and the frogs fell in this pit. And uh, they were you know, hopping along, and then two fell in the pit. And so the rest of the frogs, they gathered around at the top of the pit, and they began to yell down at the frogs down below. And they weren't encouraging at all. They were very discouraging. They said, the pit's too deep. There's no way you'll ever be able to hop out of that. You just need to give up and die. This is going to be your final resting place, basically. Well, both frogs in the beginning were hopping with every fiber of their being. But after hearing the discouraging words of the frogs up top, one of the frogs just said, you know, I guess they're right. I'm, I'm not even getting close to the top. I just need to stop hopping. And so he just resigned that he was going to die. But the other frog just kept on hopping and kept on hopping and kept on hopping. And the more he hopped, the louder they got up above. What in the world is wrong with you? Don't you understand your situation? You're never going to get out of this thing. Never. You're going to die down there. And he just kept hopping, just kept hopping. Then all of a sudden, he hopped right out of the hole. And they were all astonished. Like, what just happened? And they're gathering around the frog. They're like, wow, that's amazing. How in the world did you do that? We were telling you it was too deep that you were going to die there. And the frog said, I'm hard of hearing. I thought you were encouraging me the whole time. You underestimate the power of an encouraging word. You underestimate how being an encourager can change the trajectory of somebody else's life. Abraham Lincoln was the 16th president of the United States. On the night that he died, they took what was on him and they have it in a museum. There's a spectacle case tied with some cotton string. 
There's a handkerchief with his initials on it. There's a childhood pocket knife that he carried around since he was a boy. And there's a newspaper clipping from a recent newspaper article. And when you opened up the newspaper clipping, it said, Abraham Lincoln is a great statesman. He carried that around in his pocket. Now, we got to ask ourselves a question. Why would the most popular president that we've ever had in the history of the United States of America carry around a newspaper clipping telling him he's a wonderful statesman? Well, when Abraham Lincoln was the president, guess what? People didn't like him. And he was the lightning rod for a lot of controversy and a lot of the political stances he was taking at that time. There were people that didn't appreciate any of that. And so he was constantly being bombarded. Constantly being told that he was a less than, that he was a so-and-so, that he was a no good. But there was a man who had the courage in a newspaper to say that he was a great statesman. And he carried that piece of paper with him to the day that he died. He needed to know. He needed to be reminded that somebody was in his corner. When I was 15 years old, my pastor at the time, he was an interim pastor. His name was C.W. Scudder. One of the most godly men I've ever met in my life. I was going through a hard time. I was struggling. I had lots of questions about the Christian faith. And he was so patient with me. And we would have these conversations on Sunday morning before he would get up to speak. It took time for me. Probably nine months every week spent time with me. At the end of our time together, he said, Todd, I believe that God's calling you to be a preacher. And I started laughing. I said, no. No, I, that's never even occurred to me. That's, that's a thought that I've never had. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, I see it in you. And it was the first time outside my mom and my dad that somebody saw something in me that I didn't even see in myself. And that, those words changed the entire trajectory of my life. You see, that's the power of your words. And you can be this for somebody else. You can lift somebody else up. You can help somebody achieve their dream. You can help somebody get out of the pit and live the life that God always intended for them to live. And that brings me to our fourth point. Stop holding grudges and learn to forgive in the same way you've been forgiven. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 says, get rid of all bitterness in rage and anger and brawling and slander, along with every form of malice, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So what happens is, is we hold grudges. We get angry. We get bitter. We get cynical. And so what happens is, is we end up with a, a deceptive heart, a, a dirty heart. You, you see, for some of us, you think your problem is with your mouth. Your, your problem isn't with your mouth. Did you know that? Your problem goes much deeper than your mouth. Jesus said the problem that you've got is with your heart. Look at this, Luke 6, 45. Jesus said, the good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And the evil man, you see what he calls them. The evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. Show me someone who's critical all the time, and I'll show you someone who has a deceitful, bitter heart. Show me someone who lies and gossips to look better and exaggerates. I'll show you a heart that's full of pride. Show me me someone who's got a mouth full of profanity and obscenity. And I'll show you someone who has no heart for God at all. Show me someone who's an encourager. Show me someone who leaves people in better shape than the way they found them. Show, show me someone who is willing to give someone a second chance and they're quick to forgive and move on past the offense just as Christ has forgiven them. And I will show you someone with the very heart of God. 
You say, Todd, this is, this is not good. This is not good at all. Because when I think about the words that I said this past week, I did a lot of damage to a lot of people. I've, I've got a heart issue. What should I do about this? Well, you get honest about it. And you lay it down at the foot of the cross and you say, I, I don't want these words to come out of my mouth anymore. I don't want to be this person anymore. And through the power of God's Holy Spirit, you surrender and you sacrifice your heart and your mouth over to the will of the Holy Spirit. And you say, oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Oh my Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Now some of us, we don't take this stuff very seriously. You're going to leave here, you're going to turn off the TV and stop the stream, and you're going to keep doing and keep treating people the same way you've always treated them. Because you don't think this is that big of a deal. Well, Jesus thinks it's a huge deal. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have ever spoken. Don't you love that verse? Get that one highlighted in your Bible? I hate that verse. For by your words you'll be acquitted. And by your words you'll be condemned. Set a guard over my mouth that I might not sin against you. May the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O oh my Lord, my rock, my redeemer. You can't pull this one off, can you? I can't pull this one off. You must deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow him. That's the Christian way of doing life. <laughs> you can't do it. If you could have changed your mouth, you would have changed it by now. You can't. But you can surrender it. You can lay it down. And you have to do it every single day. Because that filthy mouth and that dirty heart, it doesn't clean up real quick now, does it? It takes time getting closer and closer to God, seeking his face, surrendering these areas of our life that we're not so certain we even want to surrender. It's about dying and saying less of me and more of you. Now, here's the good news. You ready for the good news? I just gave you the bad news that he's recording every single word. You're like, oh, that's great. Here's the good news. There's an erase button on that recorder. Because if you'll confess what you've said, he will forgive you for those things that you said. Now, that's making things right between you and God, right? But I've, I got this feeling there's some other people you probably need to go to. Make me the person you're sitting next to. Because we're the meanest to the people we're the closest to. And maybe in the other building there's some kids that you've kind of lost control a bit and you've said some things and you've wounded their spirit and they're your own flesh and blood and you need to go to them and say, I'm so sorry. And this is the phrase you want to use to your spouse. This is the phrase you want to use to your kids. This is the phrase you want to use to God. Will you forgive me? Don't you say you're sorry. Will you forgive me? I don't want to ever speak to you like that again. And then for those who are going to be the lucky ones to be on the receiving end of that, you say, yes, I do. In the same way that Jesus has forgiven you for every reckless word you've ever said about him or to him, you then turn do the same thing for everybody else as well. Can't do it, friends. But if you'll lay it down, he can do it in and through you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, who, how many times how many times have we blown it? And we obviously, Lord, don't take this very seriously because if we did take it seriously, we would have stopped a long time ago. So we just confess right now that we can't tame the tongue. You tell us that in the book of James. But if we'll lay it down, 
if we'll surrender it to you, if you'll clean our heart, we can say words that bring life rather than words that bring death. Lord, I know that there are friends here today, and friends at home, don't have a relationship with you, and they know the way they speak of others. The way they even speak to themselves is not honoring of you. Lord, they cannot pull this off without a relationship with you. So I pray that today would be the day they'd surrender their life to you. That they would say, I need you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus, to cleanse me of my sin, to make me a new person, to put a new heart within me. Because I can't do this on my own. Your will be done in this time. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.